Our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, we'll also look at Lord's Day 31. So Matthew 16 and Lord's Day 31. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13, the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. May God bless the reading of his word to us. And now let's look at Lord's Day 31. I will read the question. Let us respond together with the answer. Question 83, what are the keys of the kingdom? Answer, the preaching of the Holy Gospel and Christian discipline toward repentance. Both of them open the kingdom of heaven to believers and close it to unbelievers. Question 84, how does the preaching of the Holy Gospel open and close the kingdom of heaven? Answer, according to the command of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is opened by proclaiming and publicly declaring to all believers, each and every one, that as often as they accept the gospel promise in true faith, God, because of Christ's merit, truly forgives all their sins. The kingdom of heaven is closed, however, by proclaiming and publicly declaring to unbelievers and hypocrites that as long as they do not repent, the wrath of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. God's judgment, both in this life and in the life to come, is based on this gospel testimony. Question 85. How is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened? by Christian discipline. Answer, according to the command of Christ, those who, though called Christians, profess unchristian teachings or live unchristian lives, and who, after repeated personal and loving admonitions, refuse to abandon their errors and evil ways, and who, after being reported to the church, that is, to those ordained by the church for that purpose, fail to respond also to the church's admonitions. Such persons the church excludes from the Christian community by withholding the sacraments from them. And God also excludes them from the kingdom of Christ. Such persons, when promising and demonstrating genuine reform, are received again as members of Christ and of his church. So we continue our walk through the Heidelberg Catechism. The final Lord's Day under the grace section of the Catechism. The grace section begins all the way back in Lord's Day 5, covering Christ as mediator. In questions and answers 12 through 19, we see the definition of true faith, the content of true faith. In questions 20 through 22, then we get an exposition of the Apostles' Creed. Question 23 to 58, addressing God the Father and our creation, God the Son, our deliverance, God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. Then we see an explanation of justification and good works in questions 59 through 65. That is followed by the section on the sacraments questions 66 through 82, and now we have Lord's Day 31, questions 83 through 85, addressing the keys of the kingdom. And then, Lord willing, next Lord's Day, we'll begin the gratitude section of the Catechism, Lord's Day 32. We see that question 82 under Lord's Day 30 ends with the Christian church is duty-bound to exclude such people by the official use of the keys of the kingdom until they reform their lives. 
<clears throat> this is why I love the Heidelberg, because it sets you up. If question 82 ends that way, the natural question then is, what are the keys of the kingdom? Question 83. And we see this revealed in Matthew chapter 16. This is the primary passage concerning the keys of the kingdom. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 13, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who is Jesus? Jesus' identity is one of the primary themes in the gospel. We see over and over people question the identity of Jesus. They don't know what to make of this man. We've seen in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 1, verse 27, they say, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. After he calms the storm, the disciples say, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? The crowds don't know what to make of Jesus. The disciples don't know what to make of him. <clears throat> The disciples tell him in verse 14, they say, they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They don't identify him as Messiah directly, but they do give him a rather favorable evaluation. All of these answers fall under the title of prophet. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, of course, were well-respected prophets by the people. The Pharisees didn't appreciate John the Baptist, but the crowd did. So according to the masses here, Jesus bears the marks of a renowned prophet. But that falls far short because prophets merely prepare the way for the Lord. They don't secure salvation for the people of God as the Messiah does. Then we come to the critical question, verse 15. He said to them, who do you say that I am? You here is emphatic. Who do you say that I am? Regardless of what everyone else says, who do you say that I am? Life's most important question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Now, Peter here is not speaking only for himself. He's acting as a spokesman for the disciples. We see him do this a few times in the Gospels. And Peter responds with the right answer. Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. How does Peter come to know that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Messiah. Did he come to this conclusion through careful reasoning? Did he get to use his libertarian free will and decide that Jesus is who he says he is? How can he formulate this answer. You are the Christ. Jesus tells us, verse 17, he answered, and blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The Father has opened the eyes of Peter to the reality of who Jesus is. Peter doesn't get to take the credit he can't take credit for recognizing Jesus as Messiah while others do not. Peter's not smarter than those who have rejected Christ. He's not more holy than they are. All the credit goes to the Father, none to Peter. The Father chose Peter in Christ before the foundation of the world. He opened Peter's heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. He granted him repentance and faith. All the credit is to the Father. So how does he do this? How does he reveal to Peter that Jesus is the Messiah? In the same way he reveals it to everyone who believes. It's through the preaching of the gospel, through the word of God. We've seen the foundational verse in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the one true God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, used the proclamation of the gospel to open Peter's heart and allow him to see Jesus as Messiah. And he does this for all of us who believe. The way we are saved is no different than the way Peter is saved. We know, Heidelberg 65, the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel. So through Christ's preaching of the gospel as himself, as Messiah to Peter, as the once for all sacrifice for sin, Peter was granted 
faith, and the gates of heaven were opened to him. The same way all of us are saved. So then verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ builds his church not on the foundation of Peter as an individual. This is not Jesus giving the title deed of the church to Peter, the first pope. Christ builds his church upon the foundation of the apostolic witness to the truth. So Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 18, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ on the, as the cornerstone. And Peter himself says in 1 Peter chapter 2 that Christ is building all of us into a spiritual house, the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 19, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The triune God is in control at every moment. He elects in Christ in eternity past. He establishes his church, which is founded upon the biblical testimony of the Old Testament prophets, as well as the apostles, that Jesus is the Messiah. He builds his church. He extends it to the ends of the earth. And he gives to the church the keys of the kingdom that open and close the gates of heaven. Because ordinarily, ordinarily is one of the most important words in Reformed theology, ordinarily in the divine worship service of Christ's church, the triune God creates faith through the preaching of the gospel. Every aspect of this is in God's sovereign hand. The triune God creates the church, and he determines who is in the church and who is not in the church. The choice is his. It's not ours. And the church merely recognizes and proclaims what God has already declared to be. God opens and shuts the gates of heaven. But he does so through the church. So question 83 of the Heidelberg Catechism makes clear... <clears throat> that the keys of the kingdom are the preaching of the gospel or the ministry of the word in general and Christian discipline. And then question 84 tells us how. How does the preaching of the gospel open and close the, the kingdom of heaven? So in the preaching of the gospel and the ministry of the word, God, through the mouth of his minister, declares to all those who are in Christ that he has forgiven their sins and that he has clothe them in the righteousness of Christ. And God graciously declares this to us every Lord's Day. Every Lord's Day, he declares to us that we are forgiven of our sins, that we are righteous in Christ. Now, of course, we hear this, we hear God's declaration of this in the preaching of the gospel, the preaching itself, but we also hear it in our liturgy, in the declaration of pardon. I declare to you, your sins are forgiven. You're not under the condemnation of God. So it's not just in the sermon proper. God declares this to us even in the declaration of pardon. We also hear God's declaration of his grace in his greeting. Grace to you in peace. We hear it at the start of the service. We hear it at the end of the service in the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. That's all gospel. Our liturgy is loaded with the gospel. And through that, God opens the gates of heaven. That's what I like to tell people, the beauty of a properly constructed Reformed liturgy. Even if the sermon is a total dud, we pray that it's not. But sometimes it might be. Even if the sermon's a dud, you still get the gospel in the liturgy. You get it in the greeting. You get it in the declaration of pardon. You get it in the benediction. The liturgy is shot through with the gospel. So you can rest in that. It's how much we love the gospel. We get it over and over and over throughout our liturgy. Now, in paragraph two of question 84, we see 
The kingdom of heaven is closed, however, by proclaiming and publicly declaring to unbelievers and hypocrites that as long as they do not repent, the wrath of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. <clears throat> so in the ministry of the word, God also closes the gates of heaven to all those who reject Christ. We hear that in the public reading of God's law, as well as the sermon. Those who reject Christ hear that the wrath of God comes to those who do not repent. So every aspect of the liturgy that delivers the gospel to the elect brings unspoken condemnation to the non-elect. Now, after the declaration of pardon, we don't issue a declaration of reprobation, but it's there. It's unspoken. I could declare to all those who are not in Christ that their sins are not forgiven and that they are under the condemnation of God. And God's greeting. God's greeting for us is grace. It's the gospel. For the unbeliever, it's not. He doesn't greet his enemies with grace and peace. He greets them with enmity, with wrath. The benediction is not for those who reject Christ. He sends them away, not with a blessing, but with a curse. So God opens the gates of heaven in the ministry of the word, in the liturgy, and he provides comfort and assurance to those who are in Christ. Equally so, he closes the gates of heaven in the ministry of the word and in the liturgy. And he delivers his wrath and curse to those who reject Christ. So the keys of the kingdom are the preaching of the gospel and church discipline. They open and shut the gates of heaven. Now the question is, who holds the keys? Christ gives the keys to Peter, Peter representing the apostles. But we don't have apostles today. Where are the keys? Ephesians 4, verse 11, he gave the apostles, this is Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ. Now, we know there are no more apostles or prophets today, but we do have evangelists and shepherds and teachers. These three callings are under the office of minister. So an evangelist in some uh, Reformed denominations specifically identifies those who serve as church planters, whether in a domestic context or in a foreign missionary, someone who's planting a church, taking the gospel to where it has not gone before. Also, army chaplains and so forth fall under uh, the office of evangelist, under the overall office of minister. So uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, in their form of government, defines the office of evangelist when it says, Ordinarily, such men shall preach the word of God free of pastoral charge in a particular flock in order that they may labor to bring in other sheep. So again, this is church planting kind of context, not your typical congregation. And then, of course, we have shepherds. This refers to pastors. And then also teachers. Historically, many reformed denominations have identified the office of teacher or doctor of the church. These are ministers who teach in Christian colleges, in seminaries, and so forth. They're primarily in a teaching context and not a week-to-week -week pastoral charge. So all of these, again, fall under the office of minister but we have evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And the office of minister corresponds to Christ's office of prophet, proclaiming the word of God. The office of elder then corresponds to Christ's office of king. Elders, we know, oversee the doctrine and the life of the congregation. We see in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, the word elders here is the word from which we get presbyter. So some uh, Reformed denominations will refer to ruling elders and teaching elders. This is how the PCA does. They have two offices. They have deacons, and they also have ruling elders and teaching elders. 
deacons and elders. Whereas we in the URC, we have three offices, minister, elder, and deacon. There's not major distinction between two offices or three offices. It's not a huge deal. We're not going to break fellowship over something like that. But there is a distinction between the two. We see two types of presbyters, ministers and elders, as uh, separate offices. And it is to these that Christ gives the keys of the kingdom. We see in Westminster Confession, chapter 30, paragraph 2, to these officers, the ministers and elders, the keys of the kingdom of heaven are committed by virtue whereof they have power respectively to retain and remit sins, to shut that kingdom against the impenitent, both by the word and censures, and to open it unto penitent sinners by the ministry of the gospel and by absolution from censures as occasion shall require. So ministers and elders hold the keys of the kingdom as given by Christ. So they're given from Christ to the church, specifically to the ministers and elders of the church. And not every church member holds the keys of the kingdom because not everyone preaches the gospel or oversees church discipline. Only the minister preaches the gospel and only the minister and the elders oversee church discipline. Now, contrary to the opinion of some, the civil magistrate does not hold the keys. Again, Westminster Confession, chapter 23, paragraph 3. Civil magistrates may not assume to themselves the administration of the word and sacraments or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven or in the least interfere in matters of faith. The civil magistrate does not open and shut the gates of heaven. We think this is maybe obvious to us today, but it wasn't so obvious to our reformed forefathers. There was actual division within the reformed world in the 16th and 17th centuries between those who believed that the civil magistrate should be involved in church discipline and those who said they should not be involved. Calvin in Geneva strongly opposed the involvement of the civil magistrate in church discipline cases, whereas Zwingli in Zurich believed that the church had no separate ecclesiastical jurisdiction from the state. The civil courts and the church courts should be one integrated body, said Zwingli. He said the Christian man is nothing other than the faithful and good citizen. The Christian city is nothing other than the Christian church. So a church member is the same thing as a citizen. A Christian city is the same thing as the church. Talk about confusion. But if you remember in our uh, Tuesday night Bible studies, we talked about Zwingli, and he, remember, he wanted sola scriptura applied to all of life. He wanted to transform not just the church, but the entire world, the civil realm as well, according to the word of God. So for Zwingli, all Christian discipline, including excommunication, was in the hand of the civil magistrate. So here's how this would work. If a church member is guilty of theft, say someone steals from you. Now, according to Matthew 18, as Jesus says, you go to him, you admonish him to repent. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If not, if he refuses to repent, then verse 16 of Matthew 18, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So you go to him, you plead with him to repent. He doesn't. You take, two or three, you take one or two brothers with you, so you have two or three witnesses. All of you beg him to repent. He still refuses. Now, both Zwingli and Calvin, Geneva and Zurich, would have a similar approach up until this point. So the sin is private. You keep it private. First, you go one-on-one. -on -one, then you take one or two witnesses. But now, Jesus says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. So here's where the divide come. What, is, what does it mean to tell it to the church? Zwingli says tell it to the church means take it to the civil magistrate. Because the church and the civil magistrate are the same community. Who makes up the civil magistrate? Church members. They're all Christians. It's a Christian city. Everybody who's a citizen belongs to the church, the reformed church. It's one and the same. There's no real line of demarcation between the church and the magistrate. So remember what Zwingli says, the Christian man is nothing other than the faithful and good citizen. 
The Christian city is nothing other than the Christian church. So in a city shaped by sola scriptura, the civil magistrate is made up of church members, including elders in the church. So the magistrate oversees church discipline because the civil punishment and church discipline would be the same. Now in Geneva, they believe, tell it to the church, means the consistory, the pastors and the elders. They oversee church discipline, not the civil magistrate. So church discipline for an unrepentant church member is suspension of the benefits of church membership, including the use of the sacraments, excommunication, if the person remains unrepentant. The civil magistrate has no input into this whatsoever. You might recall, Calvin arrives in Geneva in 1536, but then just two years later, in February of 1538, the city council, which is under the influence of a group called the Libertines, they're basically antinomians, lawless types, they kind of influence the city council at this point, and the city council then decides that no one should be barred from the Lord's Supper, even the unrepentant. They tell the, the consistory that you can't prevent even the unrepentant from taking the supper. This is city council weighing in on this. So on Easter Sunday in 1538, Calvin refuses to allow those who are under discipline to take the supper. He doesn't care what the city council says. He's obeying the law of God. Well, that night, there are riots in the streets. The libertines are firing guns. They're threatening to throw Calvin and his right-hand man into the river, execute them, executed by an angry mob. The next morning, the civil magistrate deposes Calvin and William Farrell, his right-hand man, they depose them from pastoral office. They banish them from the city of Geneva, all because they refuse to allow the civil magistrate to interfere in church discipline. This is a huge deal. Of course, Calvin returns three years later and eventually institutes his understanding of the role of the civil magistrate in church discipline, which is none. They have no role in church discipline but it took a very long time for him to get that implemented in Geneva. By God's providence, his view eventually became the majority view in the Reformed world. So today, uh, we don't see involvement of the civil magistrate in our church discipline situations. Although, the civil magistrate could be involved in one sense in a church discipline situation in that in Article 51 of our church order in the URC, it says Christian discipline is spiritual in nature and exempts no one from trial or punishment by the civil authorities. So in this case, this, in our example of theft, a Christian stealing from you, the civil magistrate has no involvement whatsoever in church discipline. None. But they can have involvement, of course, in the criminal or civil proceedings that may result from this theft. So the thief could be excommunicated from the church and he could be prosecuted by the civil magistrate. Or if the thief is repentant, he can be forgiven, he can be restored by the church, but still prosecuted by the civil magistrate. Just because he's forgiven in the church doesn't mean the civil magistrate is going to say, oh, wipe our hands, no problem, off you go. No, they might still prosecute him for theft. And that would be just. One realm is spiritual, the church the other realm is civil or secular of this age. That is the civil magistrate. So we must keep those realms very clear and distinct. Question 85, how is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened under, by a Christian discipline? So the opening of the gates of heaven is the greatest thing that can happen. The closing of the gates of heaven when it doesn't ultimately lead to repentance is the absolute worst thing that can happen. We must be very clear, never forgetting that church discipline is for unrepentant sin. Unrepentant is the key word. Christian discipline is not for someone who struggles with sin. It's for someone who has given up the struggle someone who has given himself over to the sin. 
So the process involves, as question 85 says, repeated personal and loving admonitions. This is when you go to your brother pleading to repent. Then it's reported to the church. And it says, that is to those ordained by the church for that purpose, the pastors and the elders. And if there is no repentance, sadly, such persons the church excludes from the Christian community by withholding the sacraments from them. Now, in this, the person is excommunicated, cut off from the privileges of church membership, but not banned or shunned. We don't cut off communication with the person like a cult. We're not Scientologists. We plead with the person to repent. Don't cut off communication. Talk to them as often as you can, begging with them to repent. We don't close the doors of the church to them. Oh, you can't come in here. No, come hear the preaching of the gospel. This will drive you to repentance. So many have such a confused understanding of church discipline as if you're just put off on an ice flow, never to be seen again. No, we must call them back to repentance. Pray that they would come under the preaching of the gospel. And this act of excommunication should not be regarded solely as the decision of a single congregation, as if the excommunicated one could say, well, who cares what this church says? I'll just go down the street. I'll go to another church that permits me this particular sin. Notice at the bottom of question 85 there, page 236, God also excludes them from the kingdom of Christ. So the act of excommunication by a true church must be viewed as an act of God himself working through his church. God working through his ministers and elders to whom he has given the keys of the kingdom. So in our form for excommunication, under the declaration, it says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we hereby excommunicate, give the name there, from membership in the church of our Lord, knowing also that God himself excludes him or her from fellowship in Christ and all his blessings as long as he or she persists in his or her unrepentance. We must view this as God's act through his church. Now, of course, we can't judge anyone's hearts infallibly. We can't know for certain if someone is genuinely converted or not. But when a true church has followed the biblical process of discipline, the excommunicated person has no standing on which to argue that he is genuinely converted. The church has called him to repentance. He's failed to repent. The church has excommunicated him. So therefore, he has no basis on which to claim that he is a Christian. God has spoken through his church. He has acted through those to whom he gave the keys of the kingdom. Of course, in every act of church discipline, we always pray for repentance. The end of question 85, such persons when promising and demonstrating genuine reformed are received again as members of Christ and of his church. If a person repents, he's restored to full fellowship. We even have a form for readmission. We don't just have forms for excommunication. We have forms for readmission. And I've seen this personally. Readmission, restoration, multiple times. It's always amazing. Always a glorious day in that congregation when a sinner comes home. And the goal of church discipline is always restoration. In our book of church order, article 51, that God may be glorified, that the sinner may be reconciled with God the church and his neighbor, and that offense may be removed from the church of Christ. So church discipline is for the restoration of the sinner and for the purity of the church. Christ, the head of his church, gives the keys of the kingdom to his church, to ministers and elders, to open and shut the gates of heaven through the preaching of the gospel and through church discipline. And we should be thankful that Christ has blessed his church in this way, that he, has, that he is active in his church through these keys. 
Christ doesn't just walk away, move on to something else, like the God of the Deus. He is present in the means of grace and in the marks of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he acts through these keys of the kingdom. And so we should pray for those who hold the keys, pray for the ministers and the elders, not only in this congregation, but in all true churches around the world. And we certainly should pray for those under church discipline that God would grant them the gift of faith and repentance.